but do you think that there are people who have studied all of it and they're still true believers? I mean, what's going on in the mind of people? I think it's just the same for people in all kinds of high demand religions. Like the, we're emotional beings, first and foremost. We're a lot less logical than we like to think. Um, and for people who have been, you know, the majority of Mormons were raised in it and they have been taught this thing since birth. Their brains have been shaped by Mormonism since birth. Um, you know, they made this lifelong commitment when they were eight. Everything, kind of like with Tanner, his whole Mormon experience was like almost inextricably linked with his family. So every experience they have of like familial love and all these things throughout their life is attached to Mormonism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for them, they're ascribing, you know, everything that's so good and beautiful about life, to them, it has a tie to Mormonism because that's how it's been their whole life. And those roots run really deep in the brain. They don't, um, you know, neurons that <laughs> fire together, wire together or whatever. Um, that conditioning runs so deep and that's why it is such a big deprogramming process for so many people, leaving cults, high demand religions like Mormonism. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's not, a, I think there are a lot of Mormons that know there's information out there that might trouble them and there's definitely an element of not looking at it. And then I do think um, there are people who do kind of know possibly everything, but I think you can know everything about the history of Mormonism, but if you don't understand your own psychology and if you don't understand kind of the neuroscience behind religious conviction, you can keep believing in anything if there's enough of an emotional incentive to do so. Got it. So then, how would you, having said all that, Samantha, what would you say, uh, how is Tanner, how are you, how am I different? How are we different? How, how did we get out? I, I guess it's like the right combination of factors, you know? We had, I don't know, I mean, for me, the obvious answer is I didn't grow up with it, so didn't have that deep conditioning. So when I encountered that information, there was less to work through. Right. For Tanner, he cared so deeply about Mormonism for various reasons. It had been a, been a thing that he'd clung to throughout his life, so he cared enough to really investigate this stuff. I assume it was the same for you. I haven't listened to your interview. I, I from my observation, and I, I know that I have a limited perspective, and I'm not trying to generalize all Mormons, but from from what I've been able to tell in my experience, the there's sort of a bell curve to to interest in the church, and that Mormonism works best for people who are kind of you know just lukewarm, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the ones who are, you know, really firebrand in one direction are likely to get out. The ones who really care the most and who are out to be the, mm -hmm. the missionaries or whatever, those tend to, to leave because yeah. the inform it, eventually they'll find out. That's a really good insight, really good insights from both your parts. So I want I, this isn't word association, but I, I want to throw some words at you and talk about these things. Cool. All right. So, uh, and there's no rhyme or reason to them. But I'm just going to throw words out, and I just want you to tell me, you, and, and I'm going to pause. I'll say the word. I'll let you each think because you're two individuals, and then we'll hear your initial response. And uh, uh, so uh, just give it to us what it is. The first one. Uh, are you ready? No rhyme or reason. <laughs> Cultural hall. <laughs> Sad weddings. <laughs> <laughs> Sad weddings. That's fascinating. Uh, <laughs> pubescent embarrassment. <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs> you know, there's uh, even all these years having been out and studied religion and, and done what I do. I, I I still like the fact that they have them. I just <laughs> I just think it's just ingenious. <laughs> They all smell the same. <laughs> they, they're, they're, they're just this place where, like you said, prepubescence, you have the wedding there. Talk <laughs> about the feelings attached to the church. Yeah, Cultural the, hall. The place where I played basketball, now I'm meeting my eternal companion. Yeah, exactly. It's just fascinating. You know, there's a, uh, um, a Hare Krishna temple that's a con here in Salt Lake that's a converted LDS chapel oh. and the, every Wednesday night they host dances oh. so they've got it's like a you know your traditional cultural hall but they've got murals of Vishnu and Krishna and big what? statues of Krishna and all these hippies dancing in what? there and it's, it's kind of a like a uh, yes <laughs> all roads have led back to <laughs> how funny that's really kind of classic. funny to experience the cultural hall in a different context so uh, the next one that is on my list but this is in order so uh, <clears throat> church dances 
Did you go to them? Unfortunately. <laughs> I think I went to one. <laughs> you went to one. They have Actually, them in England. Yeah, I, I think I went to one church dance, possibly two, but the first time I went, I was not baptized. And I was wearing a shirt that had, it was like a shoulder cut out, so there was like uh -huh. a slit here. And the young women's stake presidency told me I needed to change. And I, so I had a, I was with a Mormon friend and she had a t-shirt she gave me. But <laughs> looking back on that, I'm surprised how well I took it. To wow. me, I, I must have had some kind of, um, something that made me okay with authority like that because. The wow. Samantha I know now would I never. Know, I'd be outraged, <laughs> but at the time I was like, okay, following the rules. Yeah, yeah, it makes you feel kind of good. Yeah, I don't know. You're probably, your blouse was probably beautiful and everything. They have you put a t-shirt on and that's more acceptable. Yeah. Amazing. And your experience of the dance is not so good? Oh, I mean, it was fine, just awkward. I, I, I like to dance a lot and was probably more, I don't know, gregarious and flamboyant <laughs> in my dancing than anybody else. And mm -hmm. So I tried to make the best time of it I could, but they got really old pretty fast. <laughs> Same soundtrack every single time. And Funny. Yeah. I loved them. Yeah. Just, in my generation, they were just great hunting grounds for naive girls. Uh, I'm sorry. Hunting grounds is an interesting term. That's Let's exactly what it was. That. I'm sorry. That's exactly what it was. Uh, as rude as that might be to, uh, to people who are more reasonable today. Uh, Book of Mormon. How would you explain? The Book of Mormon. I mean, you don't have to go through all the details. Well, you know, he wrote it this and all. But just Book of Mormon. What do you think? Summary statement. The Book of Mormon. Bible fan fiction is what people <laughs> say a lot, which well, seems accurate. Um, I think like any narrative is sort of an archetypal representation of the cosmos of Joseph Smith's mind. Mm. Um, you see a lot of personal elements in it a lot of the Bible in it, obviously. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, think, I think it was written to address the issues that Christianity was facing in his day according yeah. to his perspective. Yeah. Do you think he uh, composed it then? Do you have an opinion on that? Or do you think he had help? Or do you think it was a team? I think he com yeah, mostly composed it, or mm. entirely. Mm. I, yeah, I think he and Oliver probably mm. double-timed it in some way. Got it. Like, um, I could see him being the primary uh, inspiration behind it, and then Oliver helping refine it and uh, make it more palatable, perhaps. Okay. So now getting more into the mindset of you young kids, uh, purpose of life. <sighs> That's a big question. <laughs> it is. I think to fully, I think there's a million subcategories within this, but um, I think kind of the best thing you can do in life is to understand the interconnectedness of all things in terms of um, yourself, others, the natural world. Um, yeah. Mm. Um, people <laughs> often will say like, oh, if you're an atheist, then how do you find a purpose in life? And the answer is, well, you choose one. And people are like, well, if you choose one, then it's not a purpose. And it's like, well, you're choosing one by belief. You know, we all, we all choose, or at least are drawn to the things that, that give us a reason to wake up in the morning. And, um, but yet at the same time, you wouldn't ask like a, an animal in the wilderness what its purpose is. Its purpose is just to be. And we as animals, I think, there is no inherent purpose other than to be, and the more that we get comfortable just being what we are, observing ourselves in our natural state, the more we're equipped to act out in ways that um, reveal our interconnectedness with things, which allow us to um, act in ways that ease, relieve suffering, uh, which is, I would say, our primary purpose as people and as a, a media group is to try to uh, relieve suffering, um, yeah. Yeah, and also promote vitality, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so are you atheist, agnostics? Have you come to that after the faith crisis from Mormonism? Yeah, I'd call myself an atheist. an atheist. I'd call myself an atheist, but I'd also, in classic millennial hate to be categorized way, would also flip the coin completely and call myself a pantheist. Yeah. Okay. So I'd be comfortable with either of those labels. Okay. 
uh, which in from the uh, from a, a Christian perspective, they are one and the same. Yeah. 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 Uh, but <laughs> nevertheless, that's fine. So uh, with your atheism, and I'm sure I'm just discussing with you, you realize the difference between saying you're not sure, don't know, uh, believe there's a God, uh, or you haven't been convinced, versus there is no God. Right. Because one is sort of assuming an omniscience. So you know? I feel like that's a, a, f a misconception almost about atheism, because atheism is just saying you don't have a belief in a God. You haven't witnessed sufficient evidence to believe that. Um, and then I guess if you see agnostic as, you know, you kind of don't take a stance either way, they're not that different, but... <laughs> yeah, people tend to view it as like agnosticism is the middle of the spectrum between belief and disbelief, mm -hmm. but that's not like quite how the word is. That's actually like an intersection yeah. like this where you have agnosticism, yeah, which is saying I don't know versus yeah. I don't believe, so I'm an agnostic, a agnostic atheist. Yeah. I don't know, and I also don't believe. So what and kind of atheists are you? What does that mean? In the quadrant of <laughs> the, uh, are you a, there is no God, or I don't know if there is, I don't have a God that plays a role in my life. Um, I think there's not sufficient evidence for me to believe that there's a God, and I'm also aware that humans um, evolved to believe in shared myths, which was religion, because it fostered cooperation between tribes. So religion has been really integral to our evolution as a species. Um, and that's not nothing, and I think that's where like the pantheism comes in for us, recognizing that um, you know most religions are tapping into these sort of truths or these parts of the brain that we evolved to have. You know, we evolved to have spiritual experiences. They are um, like we're still very big on spirituality in a secular context. Um, yeah, I I guess I don't believe that there's a god in the same way that I don't believe in anything that I haven't received evidence that there is. It's also hard to talk specifically about God because there's so many different conceptions of God. Yeah. Sure. So I can say I don't believe in that conception of God or that conception. Sure. But you know, you, you take like a Taoist or a Hindu perspective of God where God is just everything that is, this like swirling, infinite, uh, you know, infinite uh, interactive matrix of some kind of which we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like to say I don't believe in a higher power, but I do believe in a wider power. That is to say, I see myself as an intersection of everything that it is. And by understanding how I fit into that integrated system, um, I'm able to draw power and intelligence from the whole thing. So I can look out at the stars and recognize its attachment to my sense of identity mm -hmm. and uh, other people as, as my sense of identity. And the more I can do that, the more I can act out of love and compassion. I see. So uh, just out of curiosity, it sounds like listening, specific, especially to you, Tanner, you've, you've, uh, said, you've given me some hints more than Samantha has, at, at least to this, is that you s tend to look at Eastern metaphysics as more viable than the Christian uh, idea of a personal God. And metaphysics is, is maybe even a stretch because while I, I, I think you'd be a fool to say everything that can be seen and felt right now with our tools is all that there is. I mean, people have been making that mistake forever. Sure. And that's part of the problem of religious history is being dogmatic about what we think we know when there's so much more going on. So I think um, I, I don't, I try to not by any metaphysical explanation when there's a perfectly physical explanation for things. Um, so even as far as Eastern religion, it's not about the metaphysics as much as it is um, recognizing like the value of symbols. Um, so with Christ, for instance, um, Christ is a, the Western, at least, archetype of love embodied, of someone who's recognized that they are all that they are ex existing as an intersectional human being. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a little bit reductive and probably not as well as I'd like to explain it, but um, that awareness um, and you know, someone we can look to as someone who was you know, perfectly upright and, and honest and, and, and loving is, I'd say, the primary mm -hmm. element there. But you know, other cultures have their mythic hero, whether that's Krishna or Vishnu or whoever you want to say. 
and that that archetype is just as important in their individual and collective psyche as Christ is to ours. Sure. And it's not important the name that you call it, whether you say Jesus or Yeshua or Krishna. What you're talking about is love embodied mm -hmm. and how do I better become love embodied. I see. Um, so yeah, it's not so much about the metaphysics as it is trying to, and maybe this comes into millennials, that we're more, you know, we're raised on the internet and the internet, I like to think of as the sort of neural network of the planet, it connects us. And so I can look at those mystic traditions and say, I have something in common, that, that spiritual experience they've had, that Shakti or that reborn experience, that uh, Samadhi, whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing. Because when I read about it and the effects that it's had on your life, I can say, I've experienced that too. And so rather than arguing who has the best language to describe it, mm -hmm. we can ease a lot of tension by saying, yes, 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 all this and more. <laughs> so Matthew, you had something to say? Oh, maybe uh, you did. Um, yeah. Oh, I thought you were gonna say I, I definitely think a lot of my spirituality now is quite Buddhist in nature. And I, I don't mean um, the religion of Buddhism. I know Buddhism takes a lot of different forms now, but. Um, from what I've studied of the Buddha's original teachings, you know, about non-attachment and kind of breaking free of these stories that we tell ourselves, because most of us go through life um, so attached to our own conditioning, so attached to these narratives that society has told us. And, and I think Jesus was a really enlightened thinker who understood that too. And I think what Jesus taught was very similar to what the Buddha taught, but in, you know, the language of his day and in his own context. Um, I tend to think Jesus was perhaps not as theistic as people think, but um, <laughs> regardless, I think he was an enlightened thinker who understood the value of ego death, you know, killing our attachment to these stories and these ideas we have about good and bad. And I think the reason he preached forgiveness so intensely was he understood that we're all just the products of our genetics and experiences. Um, you know, apparently when he hung on the cross, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He really understood that, that people are just playing out these stories that they have inside their heads. And I think um, Buddhism for me, or Buddhist principles, I guess, has been really valuable in helping me recognize my own conditioning, recognize the stories I'm telling myself, and kind of disidentify with them. So I'm not, um, yeah, I don't know if ego death is, a, is like a term people understand, but I personally believe that Jesus um, understood the value of that and kind of tried to teach that in the language of his day. It certainly should be something Christians understand. Mm -hmm. They don't, they're missing a big piece of <laughs> yeah. the whole point. And yeah, like you said, both of them have to do with kind of a, a radical sense of acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, Buddhas with just the systems of the world we find ourselves in, Christ with like on a moral level, mm -hmm. um, saying like, I recognize that my capacity for darkness is just as deep as anybody else and that had my genetic code found itself in the circumstances in which you were found in mm -hmm. I could be doing just the same thing you were doing if, if my if I was born as Hitler I'd be Hitler Got it. and sorry for bringing Hitler into this because right. that's just you almost have to you have to yeah. <laughs> but you know it, you can you, but once you realize that that then you can offer that that grace or that compassion however you want to put it and I, yeah Jesus and Buddha both mm -hmm. offer yeah. that I've heard, uh, uh, Samantha especially, you've mentioned something several times. You've mentioned it a couple times, uh, Tanner. Samantha, you have said we are a product of our genetics and our experience. Mm -hmm. uh, my worldview is that is true uh, to a certain extent, but I am a great believer in us also being products of our choices. And I do believe in choice and free will. Your thoughts on free will? Um, I don't believe free will exists in the way that people think it does. I think um, it's helpful to live as if free will exists because I obviously want to be improving, I want to be making moral choices and all those things and I want to encourage other people to do that so it's not necessarily help. I'm, I think there's ways it's really helpful to understand that free will doesn't exist like it can give you that kind of radical love and acceptance for others that um, you know Jesus, Buddha, whoever talked about. Um, but I think every choice we make our brains are evaluating all the information it's ever received through our, you know, whatever neurology setup we've got going on in there, um, and then sort of making a choice based on what we've been conditioned to value. And so I, I, I think even, even when we make choices, to a degree they are almost predetermined because it's our, our brain is just scanning whatever information it has available to it. Um, 
and even if it feels like you're choosing between one or the other, ultimately, like your brain's values are already there. It's it's a tough thing to talk about is free will. But yeah, yeah I, I don't personally believe free will. Mm. Yeah, so they've done like that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, they've done studies where they've shown uh, when you when a brain is exposed to some stimulus, the part of the brain. Um, that is responding physically to it acts before the narr narrative yeah. part of our brain. That is to say, uh, we tend to think of our minds as dictating a story when in fact it's just narrating mm -hmm. what's happening. Mm -hmm. And our body is already acting and then our body is telling us why it's doing mm -hmm. what it's doing, which is sort of a flip of how we traditionally see it. And that being said, though traditional classic free will may not exist, we do have a very real perception of free will. And in that sense, I, I look at free will as sort of existing on a spectrum, mm. yeah. and that the more you're able to become aware and gain intelligence or information, mm. the more you're able to expand and play with your tool set. It's almost like we're an algorithm that learned it's an algorithm. And once you learn that and realize, oh, I'm just, I'm just a code written by somebody else, mm -hmm. well, then I can go in and start adding to that code and giving myself the tools to then grow. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, um, and maybe this is a sort of theological, uh, alchemical perspective, but in, in my sense, that's when I become a co-creator with this, with creation, mm -hmm. because I am a product, I am a creation, but once I know that, I can start co-creating with it. Mm -hmm. I have uh, absolutely no uh, resistance to that. I think that's fantastic. Well, it's very Buddhist of you. <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought it was very Christian of me. Well, perfect. Yeah. yeah. See, it's not. A, it's not about the language, right? right. Yeah. It's it's very human and, of us. And I see that very much in the Christian uh, narrative, but mm. um, a lot of Christians don't, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, the uh, we've had, I have some friends who are, uh, they would call themselves hardcore atheists. There is no God, you idiot. They've sat right here with us. And I like these guys, <laughs> but they are, there is no free will. There is no free will. Yep. Everything is, de it's determinism from the beginning. I have trouble with it simply because uh, I, I like your algorithm idea because you, uh, having the genetics and pretty much the experiences, your other siblings and, and your whole thing, uh, you brought in information that helped mitigate those factors. Yeah. And it helped you make some decisions that they haven't yet made. And so I, I, I tend to think that when people are open to bringing in information to the algorithm, they can change. Mm -hmm. And I think it is a joint effort between what I believe is God and us. I think it's a two-way street and we are engaged in that together. As lazy as you wanna be, is as lazy as you, he'll be. Mm -hmm. And as active you wanna be, is as interactive as he'll be. But that's a society issue. Uh, that, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, it is, it is quite paradoxical, yeah. my, my view, and, and I'm, I'm comfortable with paradox. I think as a Mormon, I was taught that everything had to be black and white. Uh. And as much as I can, I've tried to, I've recognized how if you can be so incredibly wrong about every facet of life, yeah. well then I'm not gonna be so quick to draw a hard fast lines saying it's all this way or all nothing, you know? Right. Um, so I don't believe in free will and yet at the same time I believe that a belief in free will is helpful and yeah. important and we'll, you know, cause if we just say, ah, you're just the product and you don't have any choice and you just are what you are, well that doesn't inspire anyone to, right. to change and to make a difference and so it's sort of a, a helpful myth that I think is important, the kind Sam talks about, that is good at unifying people and inspiring people, and frankly, we need that. But let me ask you, just to follow up with that, Tanner, if what's the value of it if it inspires someone to change, but they can't? I think a big part of, sorry, oh, you just direct that to Tanner, but I think a big part of our ability to change is believing that we can. Um, and you know whether or not we believe we can will also be determined by whatever's happened to us in our lives. Um, and maybe to a degree, you know, our, our neuroplasticity, so maybe our age, but I, I think people are much more capable of change when they believe they can change. Because mm -hmm. for me to even, you know, for me to change, I have to first get the idea that I'm capable of change and, and discover, you know, have some kind of value system that makes me want to implement a certain change and perceive a positive result from doing that. Um, like even though I, you know, kind of am a determinist and all those, Factors are dependent on all these things. Um, yeah, I think free will can be a valuable concept, if not like a, a true one. I see. 
our audience, there's a percentage of our audience, 56% to tell you the truth, uh, <laughs> they, they sit in the wings and they watch this, this stuff and, and they are highly critical of me for not <laughs> pouncing on people with all the evangelical rhetoric that we sure. pounce on people with. They want to see it happen. And right now they want they're, a blood bath. they're slitting their wrists because they haven't seen one here. Um, pounce. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, believe in that because I think uh, the exchange of ideas, we learn far more. And I think what people at home are, are able to see firsthand from your own mouths, what you represent, what you believe, what you're about, you're articulate, you're explaining yourselves, and you know, if that's not good enough, too bad, you know? <laughs> yeah, what, what is bad. pouncing? Yeah, <laughs> too bad. Uh, the next word is uh, sin. What, any thought on that word? Is there such a thing in your world? Um, you talk, so I'm trying to remember something. Uh, not, I mean, there's like, there are things a person ought not do kill, steal, that sort of thing. Um, and I realize that that's sort of a construct that we have arrived to that we say we do better as a species when we're not killing and stealing from each other. Um, th that being said, I don't see it in the same way that, you know, we're all fallen or, you know, we're all ch choosing to be evil. Because again, it's, it's sort of like, we've said so many times we are just the product yeah. we're, we're products we're creations and um, you know it's not it's not your fault for being what you are and acknowledging that allows a sense of forgiveness of self that then extends to other people and other things um, but yeah as like sin as a concept I don't really buy uh, just to follow up before we go to Samantha so uh, if Dahmer was alive and he came and he consumed your younger brother, assuming you have one, mm -hmm. you uh, would feel that is just the product of genetic makeup and experience and he had no choice and... Yeah, I mean, a psychopathic brain doesn't even have, like, doesn't even have the hardware to feel empathy. Yeah. So it's like, to what extent can I judge someone who is literally incapable of feeling love? So are, do you think in all practicality you are able to forgive uh, and forget the extreme of Dahmer, let's just say, um, I got mad at you right now and mm -hmm. punched you in the face. <laughs> Would you walk out of here and say, I love that guy, you know? Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing is, um, it, we're talking concepts versus like my personal ability to cope. I, I think oftentimes we stress forgiveness in situations where I don't know if it's always necessary. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I try to be a person who forgives, but not because I think it's the best ideal for like, I don't know this this big overarching concept. It's for me. It's you know taking the the bitterness out of my own heart because me being upset at you for something isn't going to hurt you. It's just going to keep hurting me. Sure. So the sooner I can let go of that, the better. But um, yeah, that doesn't reach into some like deep existential eternal uh, uh, like quality of your soul. Mm, got it. I think there's a difference between cognitively forgiving someone and emotionally forgiving someone and um, I feel like at this point in in most situations it's very easy for me to um, I guess cognitively forgive people but we're all human we all have to go through grieving processes when we're hurt um, but like Tana said forgiveness is ultimately for ourselves um, yeah mm -hmm. So, you know, in Mormonism, people, you know, that's the thing. You have to forgive your abuser, for instance, which to an abused person is just saying, you, like, I don't care about your experience. You just have to suck it up and take it. And when I, I think that's like using forgiveness as a, as a you know, bully stick of mm -hmm. some kind. Um, that being said, I, I think it's a, a great personal goal to have. All right. Someone give uh, Reed a Claritin. <laughs> um, is uh, sex? What's the mindset of this millennial group on down? I know the mindset of my generation. We want as much of it as possible. But <laughs> what is the mindset? Is is there is there value in uh, virginity? Is there value in, in in abstaining from sexual relationships? Uh, that are aberrant and, and uh, promiscuous, or does it matter? I don't think we like virginity as a concept, um, just because of the way it's been used historically. Um, 
I guess our generation is big into consent, so we're fine with people abstaining if that's what they want to do, mm -hmm. and we're also fine with people um, doing whatever they want. Feels weird speaking on behalf of my generation. Yeah, this yeah. Is, no millennial wants to speak for millennials. Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that verboten? Yeah. yeah, I think consent is definitely <laughs> the word for millennials consent. when it comes yes. to sex, and that is what distinguishes, you know, whether behavior is acceptable or not. It's Let just me just that. play off that for a second because you said we understand that uh, uh, for stealing and murder. We've just kind of generally understood that that's not beneficial to society, mm -hmm. and you know I, I raised three girls, and uh, so I read a number of books: uh, *Reviving Ophelia* and uh, mm. uh, *Return to Modesty* by Sheldon, and different books. And the studies show that uh, forget religion, promiscuity in uh, women, especially, is quite damaging. I mean, the studies show that. So why is consent the you guys seem pretty enlightened. Why would you just say consent is the thing we look to? I mean, when I was 13, I was consenting with anybody, and I'm not sure it did any good for my soul. So explain that a little. So with regards to promiscuity, I don't necessarily think that it's, um, you know, having sex with a lot of people makes you feel bad. I think it's, you've got to look at what's driving the promiscuity to begin with. And I think a lot of women, um, because of what society has taught them, and yeah, just the way that we're sort of raised to feel about ourselves and our bodies and sex and all this stuff, um, you know, w women can be inclined to be promiscuous as a way to sort of try and fill this hole in their hearts, which can't be filled through sex, you know, like, I'm very pro-sex, but, you know, you, it's not a coping mechanism. And so I think it's, I imagine the reason the studies would show that is because the type of people that would engage in promiscuous sex are, you know, using it as a coping mechanism, trying to fulfill something inside them and it's not necessarily a healthy approach. So it's not, I don't have any issues with people having a lot of sex, but it's about the why behind where they're doing it. If they're doing it to, you know, just generally have a fulfilling physical experience to connect with people and it's all very healthy and they don't need it to be okay, then fair enough. And obviously if it's coming from that place of lack, of um, not feeling whole, then yeah, it's not gonna be helpful. So just to summarize, you do believe it's possible for a young girl or an older woman, whatever, to arrive at a place where she can be what we call promiscuous and engage that way with many partners and it to be completely uh, normative and healthy and never damaging so long as she's not approaching it in a, as a means to gain intimacy or some other reason. Yeah, for sure. I know plenty of women like that. Well, typically, male promiscuity, uh, it does affect the soul of the male, but I think uh, the studies show that the female promiscuity affects women more. Yeah, and I think that's because women have been taught by society and various ideas to um, that, you know, their, their bodies are these objects to a degree, and, you know, we've been taught to find, to almost see our value through that lens. And so, it, of course, it makes women feel shitty if they're like looking for something in sex and then they're only ending up kind of feeling devalued because they're not getting the intimacy they want through it. Whereas men haven't been raised to have such a toxic relationship with their bodies, with sex, to, be, to have it so tightly associated with you know, their self-worth. So you think it's all conditioning? Yeah. yeah. A lot, yeah, I'd say, I'd say it speaks more to our cultural views on women and sex than it does the actual act of sex. Got it. Um, I mean, there's so many, false narratives about sexuality, particularly women's sexuality, you know, they don't enjoy it as much, they're not as promiscuous, mm -hmm. that's a big one, when mm -hmm. in fact, like, women uh, tend to want more diversity or novel sexual relationships than even men often, mm -hmm. and they are very capable of enjoying sex. And so, you know, when you have these shame-based narratives that's coming from a culture that has treated women as commodities for male sexual activity, mm -hmm. and where they're held to a high, you know, Victorian standard of uh, fidelity while men aren't held to the exact same standard. Of course, it puts so much psychological pressure on a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, I don't think it's like basic and human, human intrinsic nature to be a monogamous or um, marital even. We, we can see plenty of um, aboriginal, indigenous, hunter-gatherer cultures where um, polyamory is a part of the cohesiveness of the community mm -hmm. and that it does strengthen social ties and it is a great good way of um, you know allowing for group intimacy and for the uh, reduction of tension mm -hmm. among 
among the group. So to take a hard stance that, oh, promiscuity is inherently bad, and even framing it as promiscuity versus mm -hmm. polyamory or something like that is already setting up a bias for this is negative, why shouldn't it be? When in fact, it's, it's m this whole cis monogamic marital system, mm -hmm. even though it may work, I'm not trying to like throw it under the bus here, it is a relatively new iteration of human relationships mm -hmm. and doesn't deserve the high pedestal that we've put it on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I ha I just lived at a, uh, in a, a group with in Hawaii and they were polyamorous. A, a woman there had a boyfriend in, in Sweden to that day and she died uh, at age like 96 the week mm -hmm. after I left. And you know, it worked for her their whole life and she was there with her primary partner and he was there with her and you know, it works. And, mm -hmm and um, doesn't have to work for everybody. Mm. But uh, yeah, maybe I'm just rambling now. So revelatory. <laughs> I am so grateful for your transparency and saying this because uh, I know that uh, there is a large number of my generation and older whose mouths are agape right now. <laughs> they are just, what the shit is gonna happen to this world <laughs> yeah. in the hands of this generation? <laughs> That's exactly, yeah, it's ah! But, yeah, this is why ideas like consent matter, because we because we can say, okay, we don't have to be so dogmatic, and we don't have to be so shameful about sex, and um, granted, like with any behavior, there are risks associated with that behavior. Sure. So it's not just you know free love, everything goes. Mm. You have to understand the risks, and you have to be careful about what you're doing, and you have to be open and honest with the people that you have relationships mm. with, and. Um, and you're you know, describing pretty much a utopian society. Here, yeah, right, right. Yeah, but it, but it, it's not. It is ideal, but like that's any system you want to have the. Uh, it's it's possible. Is all I'm saying. Got yeah. it. And I'm not saying it's for everybody, but it's possible. And our, and our, I think our generation is showing that. Yeah. Do you think th that was? A, I'm glad. Oh, that was <laughs> good. Uh, do you think? I'm oh, sorry. We're almost out of time. Evil. Is there such a thing? I fundamentally no. I I mean, like evil is a useful term. You know, to me, someone abusing a child is evil. That's a. But it's just a word. Hmm. You know, it's like a I very said. Very subjective usage. Yeah, mm -hmm. we. B I believe we're all the products of our genetics and experiences, as I keep harping on about. Mm -hmm. So, um, t you know, I guess I would use the term evil when describing situations where someone is the victim of a lot of suffering at the hand of another person. Um, but a lot of evil acts are carried out by people who are psychopaths, literally do not have the ability to feel empathy. So like, can you blame them for that? Um, and then also people that have been very traumatized as children who have never, you know, haven't developed healthily, um, mentally, all these things. So and a lot of bad things done by people who have the best intentions yeah. or who claim to yeah. ha have superior systems of morality or what have you. So you, have, you both have an explanation for evil, uh, which is different than what the standard fare is for evil, which is it's black, it's dark, it's bad, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. You yeah. would say, no, I think if we look at all the reasons behind the black, dark, wrong, we do, wouldn't say it's evil. We say it's a product of well, experience. Yeah, we, we could say evil because it's just, it's just a relative term a rel as all. Yeah, and I also think the value in understanding that evil potentially doesn't exist in the way people think. Like, it's like people um, kind of subscribe to this myth that there's this core part of our brain that like we're choosing whether to be good or evil, or I don't know, however people see it. The value in understanding that evil arises because of you know a set of conditions and all these interconnected factors is then we're able to you know kind of dismantle systems that allow evil to be perpetuated and instead of just you know looking at someone who's done a terrible thing and saying like oh he's just evil it allows us to you know go back to consider why what um, led to that person doing that thing and then we can be much more effective at reducing evil than if we just say, oh, well, some people are just evil, or, you know, there's always been good and evil, and these kind of, like, abstract narratives that aren't rooted in neuroscience and reality, mm. it's so much more beneficial to, to recognize the limits of free will. Yeah, who wakes up and says, like, I'm going to be evil today? Of Me. course, like, yeah. <laughs> And guy. if they are, what's led them to think like that, to but value yeah. evil things? Yeah. Look, at our, look at our criminal criminal justice system. It's all based on the idea that people choose to do bad things. Right. And then what happens? Okay, well, you need to be punished for the bad things you've done. And our recidivism rates are through the roof. Sure. And we're just cycling people in and out of the prison, for-profit prison system, mm -hmm. mind you. And 
um, not actually fixing the problem, whereas in other, in other countries and other cultures where they're more about um, you know, helping people through it, giving them the tools that they need to change the things is so much better rather than just treating people as, well, you chose this, therefore. So let me throw you just a couple things out that come to mind. So you wouldn't, in the classic sense, say that Marxism is evil. You wouldn't say that the materialism of the Mormon church in the $3.2 billion mall is an expression of evil. You're, you'd say there's just a bunch of men who think that nice malls are good and they can prey upon people with tithes. I, I could call it evil. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we're not against the word evil. Yeah. It's not, still like a useful word do you sometimes. E but do you, do you ever see anything? Do you see the pogroms in Russia? Do you see anything to bring up Hitler again? Do you see any mass movement as uh, being the product of evil? What, what is evil, you know? I, I think any, any mass, it's... You guys are about eliminating suffering, so evil seems to me like it would the, cause The intentional suffering. perpetuation of suffering? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course there's intentional Beating perpetuation. up homosexuals, is yeah. it evil? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah, you can use the word evil, but you also, yeah, recognize that these systems of suffering don't exist in a vacuum. Right. Yeah. Oh, I, I would agree with that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So yeah, there, there are people who are perpetuating systems and actions that cause suffering. And yeah. if I wouldn't use the word evil, it's not because I am like diminishing the impact of like the, the harm, you know, it's not to um, like belittle anyone's right. suffering. It's, it, it's not like that, you know. Yeah. Or to even pretend like true maliciousness doesn't exist because yeah. it, it does. Mm. But it doesn't exist in a vacuum. No. So, uh, and I, I'm saying no, um, I understand what you mean. Yeah, okay. Cool. Uh, finally, we're out of time, it's 10 o'clock, we've gone two hours, two quick hours. Um, yeah. You take your last breath. <laughs> it's over, done, nothing beyond, this was it. Well, our energy can't be uh, created or destroyed. So <laughs> <laughs> something's happening, but I don't believe in the continuation of a soul. Per so se. you like that that uh, thermodynamic rule? Yeah, big into the second law of thermodynamics. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. you, you believe that applies to? Th then what you're saying is there's something inside you that is generating the energy to move this corporal body around that is going to continue on because it can't be created or destroyed. I'm, yeah, I mean, energy from my body will go into the earth, wherever it goes. Um, Will you, Samantha, exist? N I doubt it. You doubt it? Yeah. How about you? I don't think so. Um, which is why part of my like spiritual paradigm is learning to identify with the, the whole of creation. Um, you know, if God is in all things and through all things, including myself, then, then all of it is God and all of it will continue to be all of it even after I've gone in the part that I've played in it and and the things that I've contributed will go on and that sense my spirit will live on but I don't know if that there's like a, a tangible tanner personality mm. that will continue onward. Got it. Yeah that was my question. Is there a tangible Tanner and Samantha? And I don't mean to say like I know that there's not. Yeah. I don't know. You just, but well no one knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it doesn't, it, from what I understand now it doesn't seem the case to me. A, a big thing that resonates with me is just the Buddhist concept of everything being temporary. Mm. Um, and we see that with the second law of thermodynamics, for example, like the earth is ultimately one organism. And uh, we like to think of ourselves as separate beings, but none of us are separate beings because we are constantly, like there's this constant interplay between, you know, we're molded by other people, we're shaped by the food we eat. Like there's everything is interconnected is my to say nothing of the genetic code that you know has all kind of yeah, come down exactly. the family tree exactly like yeah even trauma can be passed down through genetics through generations but anyway the earth is ultimately just this one organism or i guess the universe is ultimately you know this one thing and and we as humans for survival kind of need to view everything as separate we need to compartmentalize because it helps us navigate our experience as homo sapiens but Ultimately, everything is one. Mm. Uh, last word association, uh, Jesus. Thoughts. Dope. <laughs> Dope. And, and by the way, that means good. <laughs> that means good. <laughs> um, Tanner? Is this a one word or can I just Whatever you ball? want. Um, I, a lot of my, um, 
like coming to peace with my life has been, um, you know, when I left the Mormon church, I felt like I had to just reject everything outright. Um, and that was good because it allowed me to step away and then return back and see which parts I wanted to integrate back into my life. And I saw that there was a lot about um, Christianity that um, regardless of how I feel about metaphysics or, you know, the non-existence of a great white man in the sky, you know, or, or whatever model for God we want to use, um, I could still recognize that there was some beauty um, in the simplicity of his teachings mm -hmm. and in the power to um, affect human civilization mm -hmm. in a really lasting, dramatic way. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've done a video on this about my, my appreciation for Jesus mm -hmm. as an atheist, as a humanist, mm -hmm. Um, because a lot of what we term to be moral in today's society comes from that. Granted, I think Christianity as a whole has been weaponized um, against a lot of people and done a lot of harm and, and to this day remains a largely bastard, bastardized endeavor. Don't disagree. Yeah. <laughs> um, that being said, I, I do have appreciation for the man, whoever he was. So not a myth. Not a myth. Not I don't think so. I think, I think there's enough out yeah. there to, to say, yeah, he was, he was a real person yeah. who, you know, was killed by the Romans yeah. or whatever, and the extent of his, like, political activism or, you know, the, the Gospels are second and third hands account, so, like, how much can we trust everything to be exactly the way he right. said it? But I, f I feel like from my own experiences, um, my spiritual experiences have, have resonated so deeply, and I can look and say, ah, yeah, whatever... Whatever he learned, whatever he experienced 2,000 years ago, I, in my own way, have felt a similar thing. Mm -hmm. And so I can appreciate that shared human experience. Wow. Any final words for the audience? Uh, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>